It's been so long since I've actually filmed, I can't believe it. <laughs> hey you guys, so today I am uh, just getting back into the swing of things, you know? I was just away traveling, um, so I thought for today's video, since it's been a little while and since I've been uh, away from the camera for a little bit, that we could do a little good old fashioned chit chat, get ready with me. I wanted to do kind of like a skin focused video today. Um, I picked up some new stuff that I'm kind of like wanting to dabble around with. And I just wanted like a little like sunny kind of, you know, summery glow cause it's snowing here and I'm not impressed. Oh, first thing I have to talk about actually, <laughs> I was on Sephora's website and I saw these little, uh, first I saw silk pillowcases and I was like, mm, too rich for my blood. Then I saw silk hair scrunchies and I was like, just rich enough for my blood. I wear my hair up like 99% of the time, whether it's in like a bun or like a ponytail situation or whatever. So anyways, I got these things, they're called slip. Um, these are the skinny ones. I think they come in a couple different sizes, but uh, holy fuck, I can't believe the difference that this has made in my hair. I'll have my hair in like a bun for like days on end kind of thing. And when I take it out, it looks exactly like my hair just looked. Like it's not crimped or like fucked up or like super dry or whatever. It just looks like literally exactly the same. It's fucking dope, man. Pretty stoked on that. So anyways, I'm gonna invest my entire life savings into uh, silk ponytails. <laughs> I'm gonna use my Too Faced Born This Way Sculpting Concealer to spot conceal first. So I'm gonna take a little bit of that out on my palette. I'm gonna grab a little pencil, pen, pencil, mm -hmm, pencil. I'm gonna grab a little pencil brush like this and I'm gonna really work the product into the brush. I'm not just gonna like dot in and then dot on my face. I'm gonna like really squish it in there. So I like to really work that product in, especially if it's like a cream or a liquid because I just find that it deposits actually less onto my skin than if I just kind of dot it in and put it right on. And so when I'm spot concealing, I like to just use way less product than you think you'd need because I don't want to add too much like unnecessary texture to those areas because they are already textured enough. So I'm just taking tiny little bits and then every time I dot back into my product, I really like work it into my brush again. Here's a brief synopsis of my travels. Uh, I was going on a trip with my um, middle brother. So I have two older brothers, as I mentioned in my assumptions video. So my oldest brother is Aaron and then my middle brother is Stefan. So I guess it was two Christmases ago. I said to my brother like, let's, let's go like travel together. And then we were starting to kind of plan where we wanted to go and stuff like that. And we were just about to book everything. And then uh, Stefan broke his foot. <laughs> so I was like, okay, that's not very fun. So we didn't end up going last year. We, we booked it for this year. So we just went to, um, it was his first time over in like Europe and the UK and stuff. So we did London, uh, Paris, and then Krakow. London was awesome. We had such good Indian food, oh my God. We went to this place called Dishoom. It was truly divine. My least favorite, my favorite and my least favorite part of traveling is that like I find such good restaurants in certain places, but then it just is horrible and soul crushing because I want to experience that food all the time and I can't. But anyways, London was really cool. Uh, I also met up with, um, I have this, oof, like it's, it's bordering into being like unhealthy uh, girl crush on uh, another influencer named Sammy and uh, I'll link her stuff down below um, because we actually, we met and we did a podcast together. So Sammy um, has a podcast called As You Are and basically she just like interviews people on like their life and you know, what they're all about and stuff. So met up with her, we did a podcast, which I'll link the podcast down below, which was great. We also went to a really fucking good, oh my God, it was so divine. All of, the, all of the stories are gonna be surrounding food. We went to a restaurant called, ooh, how is it pronounced? U Uacha? Ooh, I can't remember, but it was divine. Like it was these little dumplings and they were so good. Oh my God, it was awesome. And they had this crispy tofu dish that was so tasty as well. Anyways, I ended up going back there as well with my brother. We basically just did like a shit ton of museums everywhere we went. So in uh, London, we did like British Museum, Museum of Natural History, then we did the Imperial War Museum. So the day that I was hanging out with uh, Sammy, I'm just gonna put some concealer underneath my eyes. This is the Makeup Forever uh, Ultra HD concealer, which I just picked up the other day. So I'm kind of just, you know, I'm uh, putting my feelers out. I'm kind of putting together my thoughts on 
this concealer. I'll get back to you at a later date. I went and did the podcast alone with Sammy and Stefan just basically like went on his own and he was gonna go to Buckingham Palace because I had like been there and I was like, it's kind of like just, I don't know, like not that interesting to me, I guess. So I was like, okay, if you wanna do that, like go ahead and do that on our, our day apart. So he went, <laughs> he like walked all the way to Buckingham Palace and I guess like he got to like the side of the building and he like looked at it and he was like, well, that's really boring. And he thought that that was just like it. And he was like, oh, that really sucks. And then he just went home. And so that night when I got back, he was like, I was like, what'd you do today? And he was like, I went to Buckingham Palace, but like, I'm just not, I'm not sure if like, it's the right place. Cause like, it's just like this really like lame, like gray building. And like, there wasn't like any guards and like, it wasn't really interesting and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, well, like, you'd know if it was Buckingham Palace because like, it's, a fucking palace like I'm like you you'd know and he was like yeah I don't know like I followed the directions I went there whatever kind of thing <laughs> and so we went back the next day and we're like walking up and he's like see this is like so lame and I'm like this is the side of the building step and I'm like you literally just have to like walk like four feet around the corner it's like all like gold and shit like that and there's fucking guards and cops with like AK-47 so we went and glanced at the uh, Buckingham Palace from uh, a more central location slightly less off to the side I'm also gonna put a little bit of that concealer on kind of just as like a eyeshadow based situation. Uh, and then we went to Paris, which, oh man, here's my beef with Paris. It's beautiful. <laughs> That's my beef. It's so beautiful. It's such a cool city. There's like so much to do and so much history and stuff, but it's just, I, I think it's going to be a long, long, long while before I like choose to go back on my own accord. I've never felt so unwelcome in a city in my entire life. Like I feel like I've traveled to quite a few places and I've been to quite a few places where there's language barrier and stuff like that. And like, it's just so, and I'm not talking about France. I'm talking about Paris because even like I've been down to the South of France and stuff like that. And that was completely different as well. Like just the general like attitude and like warmth towards like tourists and stuff. And like, I get it because I know that the comment section is going to be flooded with people being like, well, if you spoke French, blah, 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 I understand. However, I've been to multiple other countries where there's language barrier and I just feel like I've never been met with such um, disdain before like I am in Paris every time. And I've been, I think I've been four times and it's the same every time I go. I'm always really like disappointed. I feel super uncomfortable um, and like unsafe and stuff. Uh, so anyways, I wasn't really loving Paris, but we did go to, uh, this one restaurant that I wanted to mention because it's my first time traveling while eating like completely vegetarian. So basically like over the past couple months, ooh, I'm gonna mix up my foundation before I get into this, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna mix um, a little bit of MAC Face and Body and a little bit of Natasha Denona Face Glow and then I'm gonna cut it as usual with the Vichy 89 Serum. So I just do like 50-50 of foundation and serum. Oh wait, oh shit, I wasn't gonna do my, oh God, I'm so confused. What I'm actually gonna do is put my bronzer on first. So I'm gonna use my uh, Soleil Tain de Chanel. How's that for you, Paris? And I'm gonna just use my little beauty blender with that. And God, man, I really love the smell of that so much. Okay, so. What was I talking about? Oh, right, right, right. Okay, so um, basically like over the past couple years, I've been learning about um, eating more plant-based uh, and so kind of like my little transition has been very slow. Pretty much what I was trying to do was just slowly get used to substitutions and stuff like that. So like swapping out milk for different types of plant milks, swapping out butter for like vegan butter or like oils and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I've been doing slowly over the past little bit. But when I traveled or when I was like out of the house with friends and stuff like that, I would just eat like whatever pretty much. Food is like so social for me and it's a huge part of why I travel at all because literally like I spend the majority of my time when I'm on vacation planning my meals. <laughs> I don't know, I was nervous about making that commitment of like not eating um, meat and stuff like that, especially because there's like a lot of countries where like they're eating very meat forward diets and that is like their culture and I want to be able to like experience that while I'm there. I was still eating however when I was traveling and when I was out with friends and whatever. And then when I was in my house, I was just trying to, uh, you know, 
adapt to more of a plant-based and definitely like vegetarian lifestyle, but the date was December 6th. Oh my God, still to this day. I wish, I wish I had known that this was the day that I was gonna go like vegetarian completely across the board because I would have eaten so much Taco Bell in preparation. But basically I, I just, I completely stopped eating meat anywhere. Not when I'm traveling, not when I'm out with friends, not when I'm at home. So meat completely cut out of my diet since December 6th. And so over the past couple months have been sort of like me getting used to traveling for the first time without eating meat. So when we were in Mexico, I didn't eat meat. And there was quite a few restaurants actually that we went to that like literally didn't have a veggie option. <laughs> because in Canada and in America and stuff like that, like basically any restaurant, like even if you're at a steakhouse, it doesn't matter. There's usually going to be some kind of veggie option or at least a couple. Um, and then this was the first trip kind of like traveling into Europe while eating no meat. I know that everyone says it's so easy to like travel without eating meat and whatever kind of thing. And I'm here to dispel all of these rumors. <laughs> I'm gonna be taking um, the Nude Sticks uh, Nudies Matte in Sunkissed. This is a new one. Um, I just picked it up the other day. I don't know why I went to go smell it because I smell everything. It doesn't smell though. This color is <laughs> beautiful. I'm gonna take this little like elf brush. It has little long hairs here and I'm gonna kind of just whoop, whoop, put it on like that because I saw someone do it on Instagram. Okay, so I'm just kind of picking up just a little bit of product on the very tippity tops of those bristles. Yeah, I think the thing that I find the hardest about eating vegetarian while traveling, and I can't even imagine vegan, um, if I end up completely adapting to that down the line like I'd like to, it would be easier if you were traveling with someone that was also on that kind of like dietary restriction, but it was kind of tricky, you know, traveling with people that were going to be eating meat because when we were down in Mexico, we were with like Matt's whole family and my parents were there as well, all of which like they all eat meat. And then when I was traveling with Stefan, he eats meat. It, it is tricky because unless you wanna be the one person being like, oh, okay, sorry, we actually have to go to this very specific restaurant and um, there'll be nothing that you guys wanna eat there, enjoy. I guess it would depend, like maybe down the line, I would be more dedicated to the point where like I would bring my own food or be willing to go off on my own to go eat or whatever kind of thing. I found London mostly really easy and there was like lots of options and stuff like that. Even at places that weren't like vegan or vegetarian or whatever, there was like still tons of options at most restaurants. Paris, I felt like was really difficult personally and, and honestly mostly attributed to the fact that there is a language barrier. So it's a lot harder to, you know, scan through a menu that's French if you don't speak it completely and like know that there's absolutely nothing in that dish that isn't like meat based um, and even to communicate it to your servers and stuff like that. It's a little bit trickier. So um, I, I did find Paris a little bit harder, but we went to this one restaurant. I'm not going to try to pronounce the French name, but it's the French name for the dolphin. And um, we went in uh, because it was recommended to me by a friend. And when we got there, we realized that there was no like vegetarian mains because they only had a French menu online. So uh, when we got there, we asked the waiter and he was like, oh no, we don't have any vegetarian mains. But then he was so lovely. It was like such a good interaction. It like warmed my little like heart towards Paris. Um, he was like, we can, throw something together for you. And I was like, awesome, that'd be great. So they made like this like super beautiful, um, like a dish for me that was vegetarian. And I just thought it was so nice because like obviously they were doing it on the fly and like it's going to take more time than like making something that's on their menu. But I thought it was so nice. And so I just wanted to like mention it here because the service was just impeccable. They were so sweet. Um, they were really, really helpful with like trying to translate for us and stuff like that. So I really, uh, I really enjoyed it. Ooh, also I was going to say, um, because I was asking for food recommendations and a lot of people were like, use happy cow. I think the thing for me is that I would always rather get a recommendation from like a local who lives there. I don't, I'm not like a like eat to live person. I'm like a live to eat kind of person. So I think it's like a really great resource for sure. Like it's not, I'm not trying to <laughs> trash happy cow. <laughs> Just like, I know that everyone's gonna be recommending it to me. And so that's like my little, uh, my little spiel. I mixed up my foundation. I'm gonna dot it all over my face. So in Paris, we did the uh, catacombs um, and then we did the Louvre, which we did for like almost like an entire day. Like it's just such a huge, such a huge place and there's so much cool stuff to see. It's incredible. It really, really is. So we did that. What else do we do in Paris? Oh, we went to Notre Dame and that was about it. We were only there for two days. And then we went on to Poland. So 
The reason I had chosen Poland was because basically we were like looking for where we should go when we were planning this trip and stuff like that. And I was asking Stefan like, you know, like what kind of things do you want to see, whatever. And so we had decided on Paris and London, but I really wanted to go somewhere that I hadn't been before. And I've always really wanted to um, go to Auschwitz. We ended up deciding on Poland. It wasn't like I was planning to go to Poland because that was like my destination. I wanted to go to Auschwitz and it just so happened to be in Poland basically. But Krakow where we were staying like truly took my breath away like it's one of my top three cities hands down like one of my favorite places I've ever traveled to it was so incredible the buildings there so we were staying in like old town um the buildings were so so beautiful it was so clean everyone was really really friendly and the food actually was awesome like a lot of people said to me that it was going to be one of the harder cities to try and be like vegetarian in um but i had like no problem at all well i wouldn't go as far as to say no problem but there was like tons of options um and all the food was really really good so uh, we went, the first night we went to a restaurant called H Hamsa. Sorry, I'm like, I'm so, I'm so bad with like accents. Hamza. Hamza. We got like falafels and hummus and baba ganoush and all that good stuff. It was so delicious. It was awesome. It was really, really well done. The second night we got pierogies. I'm not a pierogi fan because they all suck in North America, but good God. <laughs> it was so like because they're all obviously handmade and stuff oh my god it was just so divine i loved every second of it and they had this sauce that was like so garlicky like it was almost spicy because of it Ugh. it was so fucking good so i really enjoyed my time in poland um we went to what did we do so we did auschwitz the first full day that we were there um and then we did uh schindler's factory and we did the what was the other place that we went to oh yeah the salt mine oh my god it was fucking bizarre it's just crazy so okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna take some time to explain what we did in poland here but what else am i doing oh yeah i'm gonna set i'm gonna set underneath my eyes a little bit i'm gonna do my brows i'm gonna be doing my little soap brow situation and then i'm gonna be using a powder to fill it in so i'm using the anastasia brow duo in dark brown i usually try to use the lighter side and the soap that i'm using is uh dr bronner's Soap, okay. So I go through first with the spoolie and soap on it and then I go through after once it's a little bit dried down with my powder. So I had a ton of people asking me questions about Auschwitz. So um, I'm going to uh, go over like our whole little experience there, what it was like, all that kind of stuff. So if you're sensitive to this topic at all, just know like this is gonna be, I'm gonna talk about it for a little bit here. So we chose to do um, a private tour at Auschwitz. It was really important to me to just be able to be super proud present basically and be able to like ask all the questions that I wanted to ask and all that kind of stuff so a lot of the guided tours were groups of like what looked to be like 20 or 30 people which for me I just feel like it wouldn't have been the same experience if we were in a group that large because you're in kind of like small rooms and stuff like that so it's sort of like you're trying to hear what the guide's saying and then you're trying to get close to the exhibition so you can see what's going on and like understand everything and whatever. And then by the time that you get there, it's sort of like you're rushing into the next room and not like, I think that the guides there do an absolutely incredible job just for me. Like I wanted to have like a, a really, um, like I guess more intimate experience, which I feel like was totally worth it. If you've been like considering it, I feel like that was hundred percent worth every penny. Um, and it was just a really, really great experience great experience, I don't know. So we went into Auschwitz one first and we just basically toured the like barracks, like where people were kind of living and stuff like that. So Auschwitz one was originally a um, Polish army base that was then turned into a German concentration camp. So the first site is quite a bit smaller because they, they built a second um, camp that's like just basically down the street, which is Birkenau. So that's considered still part of Auschwitz. It's like the second kind of part to it. So Birkenau was 30 times the size of Auschwitz, the original camp that we were in, that we toured first. So it was quite a bit smaller, but there was just basically a lot of like personal belongings there and stuff like that. So all of the Jewish people were forced into ghettos. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a history lesson while I'm doing my eyebrows. They forced all the Jewish people into ghettos. And then um, from there, they started the mass deportations a few years down the road kind of thing. Like they were slowly kind of deporting people and then they were doing like huge deportations. So when when they did these deportations, basically they went into these ghettos and they said like, you know, you're gonna have a job, you're gonna have a place to live, bring your stuff with you. So all of these people brought their like personal belongings and then when they got to the camps, 
obviously their stuff was taken from them. So there was tons of personal stuff there. Like people brought like pots and pans, um, you know, like cosmetics, like balms and creams, hairbrushes. Um, there was tons of clothes, shoes, glasses, prosthetic limbs, like all this stuff. So there was, oh, suitcases. There was just like all this like personal belongings. First of all, the one thing that our like tour guide pointed out is that he was like, you know, a lot of these things, like they're not, uncommon household objects they look exactly like the objects that you still have at home basically and like it's just really crazy to see how common all of these things look because it makes you realize that it wasn't really that long ago so then we got to a room and our guide was like you know you can't take any pictures in this room um this is this is the hair room there was this huge scroll of fabric and on top of the fabric there was like a few like braids and he was telling us that this big like scroll of fabric like basically what they would do is they would like shave the prisoners heads when they got there and then they would uh sell the hair to like surrounding factories and they would take that hair and make it into like this fabric that, that they would use for like beds and clothes and blankets and stuff like that Ooh, so that was the scroll of fabric and he also showed us a photo at that time um of these like huge 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 like sacks that were filled with this hair and on the on the side of the sack there was there was letters and he pointed to the letters and he was like that's the acronym for the camp so essentially these these companies that were buying this hair knew exactly where it was coming from and then our tour guide was like but this is the real reason we're here and he like pointed behind us and i turned around and there was this huge like glass display case just filled with hair. Um, so there was two tons of human hair that they had in this room. I, I didn't even like, I didn't notice that behind me when I walked in because you kind of are like guided around this, this thing. So the first thing you see is like the fabric. So I didn't even notice that was behind me and it was just so like startling and just like absolutely horrifying like that was the worst part of the tour for me for sure so that was the first camp there was also a section where like you would go down kind of into like this basement area of the bunkers and um that was the first place where they first tested um the gas that they were planning to use um so zyklon b is what they would use in the gas chambers and the first time they had ever tried it they tried it in the basement of this one barrack and the time that they tried that he basically said that they like hadn't used enough gas the first time um so these people were left dying in this basement for over 48 hours and then after that that's when they started using it for like mass exterminations uh he also showed us these um standing cells so they were these really really small cells i think they were like four feet by four feet if i recall correctly and they would um put like five or six prisoners in there at a time and they would have to be forced to stand overnight. And there was like a hole in the ceiling that was literally this big and that was the only like ventilation there was. So you would get put in there as like punishment for like crimes done within the camp. So, so like if you didn't acknowledge an officer while they were walking past you or if you were found hiding extra bread or just like whatever, stuff like that, you would be put into these standing cells sometimes as like torture. And then there was this one cell where um, there was all these candles and rosary beads and stuff like that. And he was telling us the story about, basically there was this moment where they were collecting 10 random prisoners and they were going to be sent to their deaths um, to punish them for something else. I can't remember what it was. I think it might've been that um, prisoners had escaped. And so oftentimes like if a prisoner would escape, they would um, take people from your block that you lived in and kill them or try and find your family and kill them. So I think that's what had happened. I think there was prisoners that had escaped and to like punish the camp, they were choosing these 10 random people. And so this guy, this one prisoner was crying and like begging for his life and stuff like that. And another prisoner stepped up and said like, I'll, I'll go in his place, like let him go. And the Nazis let that guy go. And that guy actually ended up surviving the Holocaust, which is pretty incredible. But so this guy that had stepped forward was actually a priest and um, he was, murdered they murdered him by starving him to death so he spent like over two weeks i believe it was in this one cell and so then when the pope was visiting auschwitz um he was allowed to go into that cell which no one else is allowed to go in um he was allowed to go in that cell and he prayed and he left candles and rosary beads and stuff like that so that was um sort of like a super brief synopsis of the first camp and then we went to the second camp where you got to see more of kind of like the uh like living 
conditions and uh, it was pretty horrific. They were just basically these huge long barracks and there would be hundreds and hundreds of prisoners in one house, um, you know, like multiple people on one bed. Uh, they were just like filled with bunk beds basically. There was like a latrine area where you would also wash as well and it was all like these little holes like side by side. You only got two bathroom breaks a day um, and you would have like hundreds of people in there at once where you had to go to the washroom and do your washing. And then one last thing and then I, I'm done talking about Auschwitz. There was this rail cart there. So basically there's these rail tracks. Like if you look up pictures of Auschwitz, it's usually actually Birkenau that you're looking at. Um, but there's these railroad tracks that go into the camp. And so basically these prisoners would be, um, you know, sent by these rail cars and they'd just be all jammed into there and then they would get out onto this ramp. They would do the selection where basically they chose like who was gonna immediately go to their death and who was gonna go into the actual camp. And so there was one of these rail cars there um, and this was actually an original rail car. This, this person paid to have it brought back to Auschwitz. At one point there was a prisoner by the name of Hugo, who had come into Auschwitz and he had his um, prayer bag. And when you came in and you got off the rail cars, they would take all your belongings at that time. They would do the selection. You would go to the camp or you would go to your death. Hugo refused to give up his prayer bag. And so he was beaten to death, like as soon as he got off the rail cart. So when they found this original rail car from Auschwitz, um, and it was paid to be brought back. It was actually paid to be brought back by Hugo's son. And when it was transferred back, Hugo's son came to Auschwitz he prayed and he left his prayer bag in the rail cart, like locked in there, which is really touching. I thought that was a really, really like neat and like special story. So just wanted to share that with you guys. Um, but anyways, the, the, whole, the whole tour of Auschwitz was absolutely incredible. Our tour guide was named Lucas and he was incredible. If you ever get the chance to go, I would really, really recommend going. It's, it's, it's horrifying, it's really hard. It's like a really um, heavy subject, obviously, and it's really hard to, to be there and to see it and just, like recognize the gravity of this situation. And if you don't think you'll be able to uh, get the chance to go over there and you wanna help in some way, you guys can always donate. Um, it's really like important to them to, you know, keep this place running. And actually um, our tour guide told me that one of the largest financial contributors to the memorial is uh, Germany. So you guys can donate. You can also um, follow them on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, when I was there, our tour guide um, was saying that he was like part of their PR team and stuff like that. And they, he was saying like, that they had talked about like a couple years ago, they were like, should there even be a website for a place like this? Like, should we be on Twitter? Because it just felt so odd to them basically. And even when you go, if you do follow them on Twitter, you'll see all these people responding being like, oh, like it feels weird to like this. And it is weird, but like for them, it's just really about like preserving the memory. And the people that work there, if I can say anything, it's, it's, it's their life like it really is like they're so dedicated they're so passionate like I didn't see a single person there where I felt like oh this is just like a job to them like all of them are there for for a reason and they all take it so seriously and it just really um I'm just I was so impressed like I was so impressed by how they've maintained that place and they've turned it into such an educational experience in such a respectful way. It's it's just truly incredible. So anyways, if you wanna support, you can donate, you can follow them on Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. I'm gonna use my little Tom Ford uh, duo thing and I'm gonna use the highlight off that one because it's just kind of like a little, little you know, it's nice. And I'm just gonna tap that on with my finger. Um, so we did the salt mine, which was really incredible. We also did Schindler's Factory, which I thought it was interesting, but I felt like I, I really like the fact that Auschwitz is like preserved as it is sort of thing. So when you're there, like you feel like you can see like the, the whole area and stuff. Whereas like um, Schindler's factory was very, like almost like gutted and just filled with like the museum kind of thing. So there was tons of information. Like it was really all like super interesting information, but I do wish that like, you kind of got to see like more of like the original building, I guess. But when um, the war was over, um, Poland was still under Russian communist order up until like 30 years ago. And so after the war, Schindler's factory had actually been nationalized. So it was taken away from him. So at that time, um, I believe he actually ended up leaving and going somewhere else. And he like took all the, all the, equipment out and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know that there would have been like really much in there anyways. Yeah, the whole the whole building has been basically repurposed. It was still really interesting, but it was 
not as impactful as I was kind of like hoping for, I guess. And then we had to fly back to London because we were flying out of there to go home. And we went and saw Book of Mormon, which was awesome. It's a really great show. It's been on forever. Very offensive. Lots of people get up and walk out um, in the middle of it. But that was our uh, little trip. It was really great. It was good to uh, get out and go do that with my brother. And uh, I'm so glad to be home. I think I'm actually gonna leave my makeup just like this because I'm kind of digging this just little like nice glowy skin situation. I've, I've rediscovered my love for this. I know that I stopped using it because it has a mint smell and flavor, which I don't like. But this is the Dior Addict Lip Maximizer. This is in the shade 001 and I really like it. It makes my lips look so nice, I feel. So I'm just gonna put a little, that's like absolutely expired. <laughs> Oh God, this is so expired. Anyways, I really like how it makes my lips look. Anyways, you guys, that's my chit chat. Get ready with me on my trip and uh, all that kind of good stuff. I'm so excited to jump back into making content for you guys and uh, I'm happy to be home and I will see you next time. Can't remember how I sign off. Okay, okay, peace out, bye.